Thank you for downloading this podcast from the British Theatre Guide. For more information about British Theatre Guide, please visit britishtheatreguide.info. Actor Greg Hicks has played many leading roles at the National Theatre and the Royal Shakespeare Company over the last 40 years, as well as starring in West End productions and appearing on screen in films including The Mercy and Snow White and the Huntsman. He's about to perform a one-man show, The Dream of a Ridiculous Man, adapted and directed by Lawrence Boswell from a short story by Dostoevsky at the new Marylebone Theatre in London. I spoke to him a few days before it opened, and I started by asking him who is the ridiculous man and what is his dream? It's based on a short story by Dostoevsky, who was constantly struggling with profound issues of how to live a good life and how far he thought he wasn't living a good life. The novel involves the story of a, a man for whom his, his relationship to life is very negative. He, he's a, a nihilist or nihilist. I never know which way you should say that <laughs> word. Um, there's some debate about that. And suicidal, and his darkness leads him to the point of suicide, whereby he's got, he, he bought himself a gun and he lives in a shabby room and everything's gone wrong. He's lost his job, his partner. And he has this central vision of life being completely reductive. Um, the, the line in the, in the play, as we have it now, is that uh, life is an unhappy accident in a meaningless and indifferent universe. <laughs> So that's what he's living with, which is not an uncommon position for people to have in the 21st century. I guess it was less common a few centuries ago, but, but it's really common now, or could be. And this leads him to the point of suicide. Just before he does that, he falls asleep and has a dream. And he dreams of a utopian paradise. Think of uh, something like a Greek island physically. And spiritually, it's, it's Eden. It's his version of Eden. He dreams of arriving there. He dreams of being transformed by the people he encounters there, the quality of their lives and their perspective on life, which is spiritually in a much better place than he's in. He has the dream. He comes back to reality. He wakes up. He no longer wants to commit suicide. And his mission in life then is to go out and tell everybody about his dream and what he saw and how what he saw can change, fundamentally change your perspective on life. So that's loosely it. The one added ingredient is that this particular evening, when he's telling the story to this particular audience, it's the first time he's included a bad section of the dream in which he corrupts the islanders with his 21st century or his human failings. And he tells us about that, uh, which happens in the novel. So as well as dreaming about this glorious Eden where a new perspective is present, he also tells us how he ruined that. He was the snake in the garden. Let's put it like that. Um, that still doesn't alter the fact that he wants to come out and tell people that it is possible to live a better kind of life. So um, that's basically, that, that's where we're at with yeah. this short story. It's been adapted by m my brilliant director, Lawrence Boswell, and he's directed it, directed me in it. And... Uh, he did. He wanted to do this during COVID, during the lockdown. I think he felt it was a, a way out somehow of that dreadful situation we all found ourselves in. Yeah, uh, and I, I'm sure. I'm sure there were other imperatives within him to look at this novel and uh, consider it as something worth listening to or witnessing or sharing. So he did. Um, so that's it, really. That's you know. That's what it is. Yeah. I mean, initially it sounds rather bleak, but he goes on this spiritual journey, which I suppose a bit fits with the idea of lockdown in that a lot of people were left at home contemplating yeah. their lives, weren't yeah, they? The contemplating, contemplating the meaning of their existence, yeah. um, which is what happens to him. And Dostoevsky, you know, he's, 
I mean, as well as being you know a, a remarkable uh, playwright of, uh, of you know no mean genius, he was always struggling with his own suffering and his own torment about how he felt he was not living a you know spiritually the best life he could lead. So he was constantly at odds with himself over certain uh, pretty profound issues, really. Yeah. How does it feel to live through that? I mean, I know you haven't uh, started the performances yet, but uh, to go through that process. Well, you... we did a, we did two run-throughs at the end of last week, and I must yeah. say, on Sunday, I did feel I'd been run over by a herd of elephants <laughs> in stilettos. Yeah, um, if that's possible. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to have to learn how to how to n navigate the complexities of it without, without it completely wiping me out every time I do it. But that's always the way with, with things of this magnitude. You, you, start, you start off and, you know, they, they hurt you a bit or a lot. And then eventually you find a way of, uh, you know, going down the river without falling out of the canoe every five minutes. <laughs> But this yeah. is just you on your own, because a, a, a solo show, any solo show, is quite a daunting yeah, prospect, isn't yes, it? Yes, well, it's the third one I've done, and I have to say, after I did the first one, I swore I'd never do another one, and then I did another one, and I, after that, I swore I'd never do another one. And uh, and here I am again, doing my third one, and I, there were two other projects that I was thinking of doing as as one-man shows. I don't know quite... I never thought I'd do a one-person show ever. I didn't think I had the um, the motivation or, or 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 the skill to to do it, or or to even attempt to do it. But it it seems that this is by far the most challenging one. The two previous ones were, although very rich and textured and worth certainly worth doing. This is much um, much more demanding in a way because it's less to do with an artifice of of a character I'm playing, you, you are going to encounter me. <laughs> so it's a bit, it's not like I'm, I am playing a character, but essentially it's my spirit that, right. sh that hopefully shines through or something about me. And people will either, um, you know, will either respond to that <laughs> or they won't, they won't get, a, they will get on with me or they won't get on with me apart from the fact that I'm telling this uh, extraordinary story so it's much raw it has a more raw quality than than the the two times before when i've done it which is both uh liberating because i'm not hiding behind a I'm not hiding but it's not that i haven't got the artifice of a character uh as much as i had before so it's i'm very much more on i won't say on display because that that doesn't that's not a very useful image but it's me out there. It's an encounter. It's an it's an encounter that's much more personal than perhaps before. Yeah. So, what's the rehearsal room atmosphere like in a show like this compared to a, a bigger cast show? Well, I mean, it's going to be it going to be more intense. I mean, uh, we, we we spent three weeks in a, a small room. Um, that's myself, Lawrence, and uh, our marvelous DSM Cat, who kind of runs the show. Yeah, it's intense. It's, uh, it is intense and it's intense in a very particular kind of way, uh, which it wouldn't be if there were four people in the cast or 40 people in the cast. It's just a different creature. You know, we, we Lawrence and I'd spend all day working on it. And then maybe at lunchtime, we just wouldn't say a word to each other. <laughs> ah. um, and I'd have to lie down on the floor and shut my eyes and stop talking to him for a bit. Uh, and he would feel the same. So it's yeah, it's a different demand. It is a different demand, and I, I don't know. I, I for some reason I felt ripe for that at this particular point in my life, for one reason or another. To expose, so, yeah. to expose certain aspects of yourself to an audience. Yes, um, I, 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 you know, I have been asked, "Why did you do this now? Or why did you do it at all?" And it's because. Well, I'm a great believer that things come come to you. They come they come to you because you're giving out 
I'm talking about the perspective of uh, from the perspective of an actor now. What what work you draw to you? So, sometimes you might be giving out. If you're lucky, that is, uh, millions of actors aren't lucky. They don't they don't get anything back. But I, I got this back, this particular project, because I think of the the particular state of being I was in, and have been in, and sometimes touch. I don't know, it was in synchronicity with this particular piece. So it seemed to be, it seemed to be right for me to do it. Yeah, yeah. I haven't had anybody saying to me, why on earth, why, why would you want to do that? Nobody said that to me, actually. And those people who read it, uh, who, who I, I showed it to, said, oh, yeah, I can see why you'd, you'd want to do that. Yeah, I could see why you want to do that. And that's actually not the case. I, uh, as uh, with previous things that I might have dabbled in, I, um, uh, well, we could talk about that, but, uh, but, but maybe we won't. Think, things uh, where um, you might have asked yourself. Yeah, yeah, yes, where, where friends have said, you can't possibly do that, Greg. You really can't do that. Or conversely, you'd be crazy if you didn't. But anyway, this one just seemed to be, and all the signs were were right. And also, where I'm doing it, I, I've often walked by the the you know this particular building, and 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 given that its inspiration, you know, was Rudolf Steiner, and I've I've often thought, gosh, I was my my elder kids. I remember considering. You know, having them educated under this system, although that didn't work out as it happened. But um, I've always been rather fascinated by this place, and uh, and the people who work here have a very particular ethos and a very particular quality of humanity, which I really, really like. There's something incredibly, profoundly welcoming about this place, and also very creative about this place. So all those all those elements, like where it was, what it was. All seem to fit. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a fairly new theatre as well, or a newly refurbished Yeah, theater. yeah. Um, uh, really. And it feels that way. It feels like it's, um, it's new and it's fresh and it's on the move and it, the possibilities are endless in a place like this. Uh, it's a great location. I mean, really good. Um, yeah. So I'm, if I was doing it anywhere, um, I must say that this is a brilliant place to, um, to launch it. Uh, actually yeah yeah uh, i've noticed you've said in the past that you are uh, a physical actor you take a physical approach has, has um does that come through in this particular show yes yeah very much so i mean yeah i um i am supposed i'm, I'm supposedly known as an actor who's very physical you know i I'm, i i i i i've studied various uh disciplines n- not in uh, astonishing depth, but in in enough depth for me to know them and for me to have incorporated some of them in into my system. Uh, capoeira was one, the Afro Brazilian martial art. I did that for a long time, uh, which took me to Brazil. And a very very dear friend is a capoeira master, so I studied with him and then became a friend. Uh, I I did a, quite a lot of buto for a while, which is a Japanese dance form. And these days, I, I still do lots of yoga, lots of Pilates. I'm the joke about me in the well. There isn't. There well, are lots of jokes about me in business, but one might be that I'm constantly upside down. I'm always doing <laughs> handstands or standing on my head. Or uh, I've got this theory that if you see the world enough upside down, your perspective m- might be healthier. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I don't know whether that's true or not, <laughs> but I do do lots of hands dance. Yeah, and I do, I do use those disciplines, uh, and it is reflected in this particular piece. I suppose years and years ago, I did a lot of mask work with um, Sir Peter Hall at the National, um, quite, you know, really high profile stuff, and that was a major, major part a chapter in my my particular story. And he uh, he gave me the chance to explore. If I am a physical actor, he certainly gave me the three amazing projects in which to discover that more. Yeah. So y- y- this particular project, yes, I'm um, 
I'm not just sitting on a bench. No, <laughs> no, I'm not. Which, in fact, I was in the last project. Right. Uh, I, uh, I was in a railway carry. It was a project, uh, um, the Kreutzer Sonata, written by Tolstoy, but it's all about a man in a railway carriage right. talking about the reason why he murdered his wife. But it's very specifically located in a railway carriage. So I did a lot of sitting down in this, uh, in that. Uh, in this one, I'm um, on the move much, much more. Yeah, it sounds like you're going through a Russian period at the moment. Then, are you? yes, yes. <laughs> well, I've my grandfather was Ukrainian, as it happens. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got that in my blood. And those writers, you know, your Tolstoy's and your Dostoevsky's, they my they would be my default novel uh, landscape. Really, if I was on a desert island, it'd probably be a Russian writer that I'd be reading or uh, someone from that part of the world. Yeah. As indeed my pl Desert Island playwright would be Chekhov. Um, uh, I mean, I know that's sa sacrilege for me to say that given I've done, my, I've done so much Shakespeare in my time, w w remarkably and wonderfully, and, but actually, yeah, I take Chekhov probably. And that's a, that's a fairly provocative <laughs> thing to say. Yeah, I take Chekhov to a Desert Island. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned Peter Hall. Um, not everybody got on with Peter Hall. I've got stage blood by Michael Blakemore on my shelf just now. Ah, that. yes, but, uh, yeah. But no, he, changed, no, he, he changed your he, life, you said, didn't he? He, he I mean, I, I was there at a really kind of, you know, a really rich and volatile and dangerous time. Uh, he, he had many, many detractors, of course, many admirers, but he also had many detractors. I was very lucky. I... I in those days, uh, I often talk about this actually to younger actors now, it was possible to be an apprentice, to, to have a mentor, someone who'd, who'd bring you up through the ranks, who would look after you, who'd guide you, who'd criticize you, who, who would, uh, yeah, apprentice you. And he was that for me. So I was, I was an apprentice under the you know, the watchful and brilliant eye of Sir Peter Hall. And that's a rare thing. You, that's very hard. It's really hard to do that now. It's very hard to find anybody that's in a position to do that apart from anything else. But it's also very hard to find anybody who would wish to do that because there's such a quick, it's a much quicker turnover and it's much more cutthroat and uh, markety placey than it used to be. Uh, I, I can't, because of social media and all that. Um, but so, yes, yes, he did have his detractors. He had a lot of detractors, um, uh, some of whom uh, I'd worked with and, and who would say to me things like, how, how, did, how did you manage to do so much work with him? But I did. I, I loved working with him, and he was completely instrumental in whatever story I've had as an actor, completely, very much central to that. Yeah. Another director that you were with, uh, uh, I was fortunate to do, uh, to interview him about ten years ago, uh, Michael Bogdanov. Oh yes, oh Bogdanov. Yeah. And he was um, sadly no longer with us, but uh, no, he, he directed a... you in Romans in Britain, and he, yes, was, he, he, directed, he was still yeah. very bitter about the experience that he had with that. What, well, we all had. A, I mean, he particularly had a bitter experience, but the, yeah. the, the whole thing was j just so so unexpectedly, excessively misguided and misinterpreted. But uh, on the other hand, of course, all that notoriety was extremely good for business. In fact, the run was extended by 22 performances, I think, because there was so much, there was so much uh, controversy about it. And I was, yeah, as an actor, I was centrally involved in that <laughs> uh and in fact um was was uh going to go to court to the old bailey to face a charge of i think committing an act of gross obscenity in an unlicensed on unlicensed premises um yeah uh bodger we had a great time and it's not the only thing i did with with him but um we had a, an extraordinary time on that project and peter uh, hall uh, obviously was running the national at the time i mean i he knew there'd be trouble, and in fact, he came up to me after the first run through, and he said, "There will be trouble about this. You do know that, don't you?" And I said, "Well," I, and I was very much younger then, so I wasn't really aware of that kind of trouble. But there was huge trouble. But in many ways, it was an amazing thing for me to do, really, because you know, I did this play in which 
I was completely naked and, you know, uh, I had this terrible, uh, uh, you know, I was raped by a Roman soldier. Oh, I wasn't really, but I mean in the play. And and then the next project I did was the Oristia, which was all in masks. So I'd gone from doing a role where I was absolutely stark naked to a role in which, in fact, you couldn't even see my face. So, and that was... um. That was actually a really, really wonderful thing to be presented with, actually. Yeah. Now, I remember Peter saying to me at once in rehearsal, which might be of interest to anybody listening, he said when we were rehearsing the Oris style, and I'd just finished doing the Romans in Britain, and he said, you know, you do know you reveal more of yourself in a mask than you ever did when you were totally naked. And I've never forgotten him saying that from a psychological point of view. That was my experience, uh, 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 although I didn't know that until perhaps he pointed it out. But yeah, that was an, it was an interesting observation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, they're, they're both significant productions that uh, yeah. Jocelyn Herbert's uh, wonderful design for the Oris Day appears in oh, so wow. many, so I many mean, theatre texts. You know, that, that mask is uh, the, the famous mask, which I think is in a museum in uh, Germany somewhere, somewhere like that. I, I, that, well, that was like being given some alchemical talisman, which I just happened to be wearing night after night after night after night, which was, uh, she it was a superb piece of design on her part. She was totally genius, uh, and, and she designed those masks by looking at the actors for many, many weeks and trying to capture something about not only the essence of the character they were portraying or being or playing, but but also the, who you were. And uh, the mask she created for me w was extraordinary. It was like putting on me onto my face it was really strange i can't describe it i had a ver very particular relationship w that was about as potent and intimate as you could get between an actor and his mask it, as it were yeah. yeah mask acting is something that's very difficult to explain to somebody who hasn't tried it really into the way it sort of takes you over well the only way you'd you, the only way you'd know about it is is if you were in a workshop situation you yeah. put a, ma a mask on it's not for everybody um, a lot of people really don't d don't like it don't get it don't it doesn't it doesn't work for them it, it, it something doesn't go pop in their creative uh heart mind um but it for some reason it did with me it really and I'm not, I wasn't trained or anything. In fact, I'd never put a mask on in my life before we'd started doing those uh, workshops and, and eventual rehearsals. I'd never done that. But for some reason, it, it flicked a switch in my, in my creative, uh, uh, you know, world that I can't, is beyond words. I don't know, I don't know what it was. It just suited me. I was looking at, uh, back of my reviews to see um, what I'd seen you in. And I saw you in a, a great part in one of my favourite pieces of writing. I saw you as Roy Cohn in uh, Angels in America when you brought it up to Salford. Oh, my God. Well, God, yeah. Well, what a play. Yeah. <laughs> what a role. I had I struggled with that, that role quite a lot. Um, I did struggle with it. And, and I, I, struggled, uh, I struggled quite a lot with a play, ultimately. Um, when Angels in America first came out, it was just so, such a, uh, such a lifeline for so many people who were suffering so deeply. But we did it at a much later stage. After I think after I can't remember how many years after the first production it was, and the play had sort of the landscape had changed in society, and so the play sat in a different way than it had done before uh and i i i guess i i guess i found that quite tricky to to deal with apart from the trickiness of playing that role which i sort of got hold of but i didn't really uh, i i was disappointed in myself actually uh, uh, and um, uh i didn't think i'd got it down really, uh, but which sometimes happens, you know, yeah. you do things and you know, you haven't quite 
you haven't quite pinned it down or released it or whatever the word is. Anyway, so you saw that. Yeah. The song. Yeah, yeah. I loved it. I loved doing it there and I loved uh, loved that place. It was amazing. My God, it was yeah. amazing. Yeah, I'll be there again tomorrow night. <laughs> oh, really? Do the same what? Oh, it's uh, My Beautiful Laundrette, the Hanif Kareem. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So if if, if uh, Roy Cohn was one that you don't think you really got to grips with, what do you think are the, the parts in a in a long history of working with some of the top national theatre companies, what are mm. the ones that you'd like to be remembered for? What are the ones that you thought really suited you? Well, I think I was a good Leontes in The Winter's Tale. Uh, and by, but when I say g- I think I was a good Leontes, I mean th- that something was released through me into that role. Coriolanus was pretty, pretty good. Um, I, I, that was on fire. I, I was it, that suited me, and um, that, that was that was a good one. I, I mean, I, yeah, I think I did something um, with Lear. I I had a go. I mean, I sort of had a go at it. <laughs> it was a cavalier choice, and I, I technically, I suppose you could argue, I was far too young. But there, I had my moments in that. Yeah, I did. I did have my moments. What else? Um, I'm sure there have been other things I might have done. Uh, yeah, I've done. I did a. I did some. I did a lot of work at the um, Citizens Theatre in Glasgow uh, when it was absolutely on fire. Um, I worked a lot with Philip Prowse, who I had a fantastic working relationship with. Um, we we did some pretty good stuff there. I did a play called Enrico Four by Pirandello, and I think that was that was pretty good. Um, I only did that because Richard Harris never turned up. He was supposed to be doing it, and, he, and then he, he failed to turn up, so somebody had to do it. So I got, I got to do it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting. That Roy Cohn experience was, I mean, it's not, that, well, I, I, I'm not the person to, to comment on this, but it's only happened, let's say it's happened mm, maybe five or six times in my career where I've done a, a role and I've thought, no, you're not, is, this has not happened. And that's a shame because it's a great role. Uh, I mean, I've been in the Scottish play Macbeth prolifically three times. And uh, the first one, the famous one with um, Ian McKellen and Judy Dench, I was playing a really lovely little part um, and that was very, oh, and I was very much younger. But then I ended up playing Macbeth a long, long time after that. And I, for one reason uh, and 20 others, I couldn't, just couldn't quite catch it. And I love that play. It, it, in fact, it, um, Macbeth and Lear are my two favorite um, of Shakespeare's plays. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure in which order, where, which one comes first, but I think they're, they're brilliant. And I, I d- yeah, so I didn't quite get that either. But um, is that a bit of unfinished business that you'd like to come back? I'd to love to have another go. I would love to have another go at that play. But that's the thing about those. The, those. It's like I'd, I'd love to have another go at Lear because I played it in my where was I? I don't know. Um, before I was sixty, in like my late fifties, which is young. You you c- c- could quite justifiably argue that that's young to play Lear. And uh, yes. You can return to these roles. I mean, in the old days, people did. And you don't do it quite so much now because because the business has changed quite a lot. I mean, you know, once you've done it, you've done it, and then you move on to another Netflix series or another movie. Or Going back to the same role is something that I think you know, is um, – doesn't, that doesn't really happen anymore. I don't, I don't – you never see an actor – revisiting a role that he's played before not really i mean ian mccallan did it of course with lear but but that was within a short space of time i'm talking about an actor who might play something and then 20 years later might go back and play it again which you know in the days of olivia and gilgood and that generation of actors you would get that you would get a reappraisal or a re a re you know a re Rejourn- another journey, a return to that. So yes, if an, I'd love to have another go at Lear, but that probably won't. <laughs> ah, well, maybe it will. Who knows? 
So what else have you got coming up? Have you got anything in the pipeline? Yes, I'm going back to the National Theatre to do The Grapes of Wrath, which has just been handed to me like a perfect gift. Uh, I, I was minding my own business and and I was I was offered, offered to be part of that company and I haven't been back to the National for a very long time. In fact, I thought I would never go back. I thought maybe my... My days were over there, and all of a sudden, they're not. So I'm going back to do this wonderful production uh, of a wonderful play directed by um, Carrie Cracknell, which is going to be great. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm very lucky, very lucky to have got that and been presented uh, with something like that because I'd really thought my days were over there. So, But then actors always think that, they <laughs> And, and in some cases, it's true. Yes, <laughs> yeah. The days are over. Yeah. And no good thinking that they're not. Um, but I, in, in the terms of the National, I really, you know, I was there for seven years and I never left the building. And I was in, I, I think I was in, I mean, I, I don't think I had very much time off in that seven years. I was just one play after another, yeah. um, which I was very lucky to do. So going back will be um, a right royal occasion for me, I think. In the meantime, you're playing a ridiculous man uh, in um, a very short time. So how does it feel at the moment? Well, it's Monday and I've only just walked in and I'm, uh, uh, I'm very nervous and I'm, yeah, I'm nervous. I'm, I'm nervous and I'm, I'm uh, holding my breath a bit. Or, or, well, actually, I'm not holding my breath. I'm trying to breathe out. But um, Is that unusual you, for you to feel nervous at this stage? Um, it's a different kind of nerves with a one man thing you, because it's just you, you, you are, you are exposed in a very different kind of way, uh, in a, you know, in a play with a group of people that, that somebody else is also sharing whatever, you know, um, anticipation they might be having, whereas it's just me and yeah, I am, I am, um, I I am a I'm a bit frightened, <laughs> but then I should be. Um, I should be, uh, but I'm also really ex. Well, I, I I I'm I'm always wary of the word excited. I always find that a bit at my age. It's excitement. It's a, I, I'm I'm aware that I I'm about to go on this really rather wonderful journey. Uh, and that I've got, it's going to test me and that I'm hopefully serve it as well as I can. That was Greg Hicks, who stars in Dostoevsky's The Dream of a Ridiculous Man, adapted and directed by Lawrence Boswell at Marylebone Theatre in London from the 21st of March to the 20th of April 2024. For more information and tickets, go to www.marylebonetheatre.com. You've been listening to a podcast from British Theatre Guide. For more information, please visit britishtheatreguide.info.